Hello, I'm Jane Fuller, co-director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. Um, we've been in virtual mode um, for 14 months, I suppose, now doing um, the best part of 300 videos. And um, our videos are often organised at relatively short notice to respond to um, subjects that are hot topics in, in the newspapers and uh, uh, with government. And of course, the collapse of Greensill Capital, um, a key player in supply chain finance for certain companies, including GFG, which of course owns some of the steelworks, which is uh, remain remain uh, rather sensitive in terms of um, industrial um, infrastructure. So we've got some issues arising in supply chain finance at the moment, highlighted by Greensill, and of course there have been issued in, issues in the past, whether you know, including going back to the Tesco accounting scandal, um, and of course at Carillion. So we know it's a hot subject and we know that it's, there's, a, there's a current peg at the moment. Um, and I'm, so I'm delighted to uh, have pulled together um, four expert speakers. Um, uh, one of them, Owen Walker, is the FT's European banking uh, correspondent. And he was previously asset management correspondent, so he knows that side of it as well. Um, and he's a, an award winner in terms of his reporting on Neil Woodford's uh, downfall. And he's also written two books, um, the most recent um, on the Woodford scandal. Um, and he's also written one with a wonderful title, Barbarians in the Boardroom. And then he'll be followed by Alex Griffiths, um, Head of Corporate Ratings for Europe, Middle East and Africa at Fitch. Um, he's got a team of 100 analysts in 10 cities. Um, he's been with Fitch for 16 years and he's headed research um, in EMEA and Asia Pacific. He's, he's led the credit policy group, and so he's been monitoring the quality of corporate uh, credit ratings, which is obviously going to be part of this discussion. Um, and he started off um, as an auditor at Deloitte, so he can do the auditing stuff as well. Sabrina Fox is um, chief executive of the European Leveraged Finance Association, which represents more than 45 institutional fixed income managers. She's an expert in high yield bonds. And she's been a sort of big advocate of increased transparency and better disclosures, and also um, been keen to educate market participants in uh, protecting lenders. And she was formerly head of European High Yield Research for Covenant Review. Kazim Razvi, who's now working independently, was until recently Director of Financial Reporting Policy at CFA Institute, which is the global organization for financial analysts. And before that, he was Global Head of Accounting Policy and Research at Fitch, um, a Technical Accounting Advisor to Moody's, and he set, helped set up a technical department for Orgentius Private Equity Funds Administration, which is now part of IQ EQ. So hopefully we've got all the perspectives, uh, different perspectives covered. And I'm going to ask Owen, first of all, to, to come in and uh, explain to us um, uh, what you know? Why why is this such a hot topic now? And what are the, what are the big questions raised by Greensill in particular, but perhaps also more generally about what's been happening in this field? Great. Well, well thanks so much, Jane. Thanks so much for um, having me along today. Um, and I suppose when we talk about supply chain financing, um, it's it's and, and what Greensill has been doing. I suppose we need to put it in context. Historically, it's. Um, it's very much a, a modern spin on on a very old, uh, very ancient form of financing, which um, you know, has been traced back around four thousand years. Kind of the trading of invoices or, or IOUs, um, and so essentially, you know, let's just break it down. Person A owes person B some money. Um, person A wants wants to have that money uh, paid back to them up front. Person B doesn't have the cash; they'd like to pay it back in a month. And so person C steps in and says, I'll pay um, person B back straight away and, and person A can pay me back in a month's time. And person C takes uh, a little bit of, of, uh, of, of a payment for, for paying, repaying early. It's, it's a fairly simple transaction. As I say, it's been around for 4,000 years. Apparently, um, it, it was uh, referenced in the Code of Hammurabi, the, one of the you know, oldest legal texts ever found, where we get the likes of an eye for an eye. Um, I don't speak 
or read ancient Akkadian, so I couldn't uh, vouch for that, but uh, apparently uh, that was there. Now, what, when we talk about supply chain financing, this is something that's maybe been around for just a couple of uh, decades, really. Um, it's, uh, it kind of reverses uh, that relationship in that it was kind of pioneered by a lot of big banks. They would get their biggest customers, uh, you know, let's let's take, for example, a, a supermarket chain and set up for them a supply chain finance program so that their suppliers, be it a you know, small farm, a, a dairy farm or whatever, could uh, you know pass on the, the milk to the supermarket? Uh, the the supermarket would would uh, you know uh, well that they'd pass on an invoice. The supermarket would you know validate the invoice, and then the bank would pay the supplier back uh, initially, and then the bank would uh, the 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 uh, supermarket would pay the bank back uh, in you know a month, two months time, and and, and what. That those programs allow them to do is actually push back those payments by, you know, a couple of months, a year, whatever it, whatever it might be. Um, now, essentially, that business uh, it's it's mainly dominated by the big banks. It is low margin. It's fairly low growth. It is um, something that kind of goes on in the background. They don't make a big song and dance about it. Uh, it's something they do for their clients, uh, and you know, I suppose it's fairly boring. Really, we don't hear an awful lot about it. And then comes along um, Lex Greensill, um, and uh, you know he started uh, at uh, you know a couple of these banks. He, he, he used to work at Citigroup and Morgan Stanley. Um, his background, and, and this is a story that he's he's told many times before, is he grew up on a, a on his family's farm in Bundaberg in, in rural Australia. Um, they grew beetroot and they grew uh, watermelons. And, uh, you know, they, they sort of suffered financial hardship when they sold those products on to uh, the local supermarkets or whoever. And, and then the, the payments were delayed. They didn't have access to that cash initially. Um, and essentially what, uh, you know, what his pitch was, he said, well, this happened to my family. I want to democratize finance. I want to innovate. And, you know, these are all sort of words we should be watching out for when, when thinking about finance. Um, and that's how he ended up in supply chain finance at these banks. He set up his own business, Greensill Capital, and uh, essentially sold it as something very new and innovative when really it was a kind of a, a modern spin on something that had been around for a long time. Um, now, what Greensill did differently is um, one area was uh, he, he owned a bank in Germany uh, and he, he used that as part of it. But um, as uh, there was... Uh, Growing demand and which the bank couldn't um, couldn't supply, he started um, repackaging a lot of these IOUs into into notes and then selling them on to uh, investment funds. So he uh, started out doing that with GAM, the, the um, Swiss fund manager, and then and then when when GAM went into to difficulties and and couldn't cope with the the amount of money required, moved on to Credit Suisse, and those funds eventually grew to ten billion. They uh, were suspended and collapsed a couple of months ago, and that's that's really where this whole issue has come to a head. So, it, so that was one area that he kind of innovated in in terms of securitizing these notes. Other people have done it, but that, that's what one area he he uh, you know put a different spin on. Um, and then another area that we're we're kind of learning more and more about in the fallout from all of this um, is uh, again, it's you know. It is used in in some parts of supply chain financing, but uh, there was a heavy emphasis in his funds. The idea of um, uh, future receivables and and prospective receivables, where actually uh, these aren't based the, these notes, the, this these uh, this money going out to um, Greenstone's clients isn't based on actual IOUs, actual invoices. It's based on invoices they're expecting to get for for sales from their clients. Um, and in some cases, this 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 idea of pros prospective uh, invoices um, or prospective receivables is is coming from when a company says, "Well, I expect to do business with this company in the future, um, and therefore, uh, you know, can, can you lend me some money on, on the back of that?" Um, and we, we've heard a lot about these, and, and that's where a lot of questions are coming uh, with regards this, to this starts to answer the question about how did something sort of well established become complicated. So why would it ever be okay to have something that's backed by an asset that doesn't exist yet, i.e. a future receivable? 
Well, I think I think there's lots of people asking that same question. Um, so Greensill, uh, Lex Greensill was was in the Treasury Select Committee um, this week, and he was he was asked about um, the idea of future receivables. Um, he he claimed that uh, prospective receivables wasn't something that uh, they offered, though there is a separate legal case in in the US with um, uh, Bluestone Resources, which specifically mentions prospective receivables. And I think Sanjeev Gupta, um, another character in this whole drama. Has also mentioned these, and he mentioned it in a, in a letter to the, the Financial Times. Um, but so, so Lex denied that they dealt in those in the Treasury Select Committee. So there's question marks about that. But when when he was talking about future receivables, um, he said that, and this again is part of the kind of the, the, the Lex um, story around Greensill, is that they were seen as a tech company, and they received backing from General Atlantic and from SoftBank as a, as a tech. Uh, you know, startup, be, be, you know, really innovative company. When essentially they were, they were basically just doing, you know, um, financing. Um, and so, the, so he said at the Treasury Select Committee they were using their uh, AI, their you know, their, their great technology to uh, look at uh, the receivables they already had and predict where future receivables might come from. Uh, and that's kind of what it, that's his explanation of of why. These future receivables were, but I mean, yeah, exactly. When you start getting down those, when you start going down that path, sounds um, like betting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I think uh, let's move it on to Alex. Um, so, uh, credit rating agencies are supposed to, um, you know, some of this stuff is obviously going. It's going from something that looks relatively safe, Alex, to something that's look that um, looks racy. So how does that get factored into to the way you look at this uh, issue? Yeah, so as many of your viewers will uh, will be aware, our, our job at Fitch is assigning independent, objective and transparent credit ratings. I look after the corporate side of things, so so I look at companies. So we weren't involved in Greensill directly at all, um, so I can't really comment on, on, on the details of that. But what I can comment on is the supply chain financing that we see when we look at companies day in, day out, because there's a lot of it out there. Yeah. The first thing I'd say is that, you know, we, we've talked so far in terms of this being bad. Um, it, it has a lot of good aspects to it. Uh, you know, if, you're, um, if you look online, you can see videos of truckers who are getting paid rather than 30 days and having to finance their fuel and their truck payments for 30 days are getting paid after seven days. And if you're a small business, you can completely see how that makes sense, how that's 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 a positive thing for the supply chain. Um, but obviously, there are complexity issues and disclosure issues, which mean that there is the potential for this to to to, to blow up in in ways that, frankly, are very very hard to predict. We do have ways of dealing with it, and the best way to illustrate that is with a uh, what I hope will be a fairly short example. But sort of bear with me. So, um, we have a company which I'll call the buyer. The buyer is big. It's, it's a large manufacturer, has a really high credit rating, and it has a supply chain of smaller businesses. They are uh, would be worse rated if they were rated, but certainly their cost of borrowing is far higher. So the way the, um, the particular sort of supply chain financing we're addressing works is the buyer talks to a bank. The bank says, what I can do is I can, if you give me a, a, an invoice from one of your suppliers, I can pay that invoice, assuming you confirm that, that the invoice is okay. Um, I'll pay that you know, as early as they want, really. There'll be a small financing fee if they want it paid before normal terms. But that financing fee, and this is sort of the important bit to start off with, is based on the credit worthiness of you, the big company. It's not based on your, your small supplier. So it does effectively reduce the interest cost or the borrowing cost for those small companies. Otherwise, they'd have to take out a bank loan, which would be more expensive because they're small. So that's positive. It strengthens the supply chain. That can be enough for some companies. But given the commercial world as it is, typically there's a quid pro quo. And that takes a couple of forms, usually. One is you actually just, just beat them down on price. You say, we'll offer you this financing thing, but give us a bit of money off. And that's sort of fairly straightforward. More common, though, and the thing that, that gets more complicated is when they say, Okay, rather than giving us a, a lower price, rather than say um, pay us in 60 days, put on your invoice, pay in 120 days. So what happens is the supplier, it doesn't matter because they're getting paid by the bank after 15 days. 
but the company, the buyer, isn't paying until day 120. So if we sort of unpack that, what's happening, rather than owing a supplier for 60 days, actually that invoice is owed to the bank for, for most of that period. Sounds the like company, an overdraft. Sorry? Sounds like an overdraft. Uh, it, is, it is certainly has a lot in common with debt, which is actually what we do. So if you, if you look at the, the two companies that are the same, other than one has supply chain financing and one doesn't, then one basically shows lower debt. So it looks healthier at, at, at first cut. And it's quite hard to work out what's going on. So what we do, luckily, we're insiders typically. So we can ask companies, do you have this? What do you have? And we can actually, to the extent that payables days are extended, we'll adjust for that. So we will neutralize this. Um, the problem is other people in the market don't have that access. And you know, it's, it's, it can be pretty much impossible to work out what's going on if you're a third party. And just one little, other little question, which is, um, you said that the supplier will um, get paid promptly for a bit less. How much less? Uh, good question. It's based on the um, on the borrowing cost of the of the buyer, so the, the highly raised entity. And if you think about what's the cost of borrowing for two weeks, if you're a gigantic single A rated corporate, at the moment it's pretty much zero. So, in in terms of the the financing cost, it's it's a great deal for the supplier, which is why you can have the quid pro quo element in there um, as, a, as a further incentive. Right. Okay, and um, Sabrina, um, is, why is this an attractive area for um, asset-backed fixed income investors? I mean, it would seem that, um, you know, you know I can, why, how can there be enough room between the face value of the invoice and what's actually collected, as Alex has just described, to not only give the fine, that little, the intermediary this little financial turn it needs, um, but also to, to, for, for stuff to be packaged up and sold on to fixed income investors and to give them a return. Oh, and by the way, you can only say they're absolutely safe if you pay for insurance too. How does that? Well, I think I, I think I have the same question as you do, and and what what I come from in, in the European Leverage Finance Association is on the part of fixed income managers who are trying to invest their clients' capital in companies that are utilizing these arrangements, and they don't feel that those financial statements that they're reviewing contain sufficient information for them to analyze the the risks that that these you know that these arrangements um pr you know uh, present, and I think. What, what Owen said is really interesting that these are ancient, you know, kind of arrangements and transactions that have been innovated on. Um, and we don't, you know, oppose innovation. Financial innovation is, is what keeps the financial markets moving, uh, you know, in, into the future. But I think that the rules have to keep up with the innovation. And I think that in this case, that's where we raise issue. And we have been engaging with the IASB on their current rules as they apply. I think, you know, where you run into trouble and we see this time and again in our focus on, you know, ensuring transparency and ensuring that, that disclosure remains relevant robust as, as innovation gains uh, pace is that the rules just haven't just just haven't kept up. And I think it does sometimes take a big blow up like what we've seen and the impact that that is, you know, it has on real people and their savings and, and their lives and their businesses to, to cause regulators to sort of step back and say, well, no, actually, we may need to do something more here. Now, the interesting thing is it's all kind of happened in parallel. So the IASB was already looking at questions which had been raised by, by Moody's to them about reverse factoring and factoring receivables. IASB listeners is International Accounting Standards Board. Exactly right, yes. Um, at, at, the at the same time that all of this much more complex financial innovation was happening um, within, you know, Greensill and, and certainly others as well. And I think to take it to what, what our members do, I mean, they invest in credit. So high yield bond, leverage loans, these are already highly leveraged companies. They, it is critical for them to be able to see the true amount of debt, which is on the balance sheet. And when you think about the nature of these arrangements, as soon as it goes from, as you rightly pointed out from the supplier and the invoice to the bank, it looks a bit like an overdraft and an overdraft is a 
form of short-term debt. Once it becomes debt, it fundamentally changes the nature of the arrangement and it does create additional risks. So where there's an information asymmetry such as there is, and that's something that Alex has, has rightly pointed out, you know, investors don't have the same information that the rating agencies might have. They don't have the same information that the banks who are, are lending these, these facilities have. And because of their short-term nature, they raise even more risks because it could all come fall down very quickly if issues arise uh, and and banks you know pull these lines or there are other issues um, you know with with the financial transaction. Yeah, so Credit Suisse got caught out to the tune of ten billion pounds worth of these funds, but it just why was it? I I still struggle to understand why um, these packages were attractive to invest in in the first place. I mean, you know, is the fixed income market, so that, are the investors so desperate that they would go for, for a tiny um, interest return on, um, let's, you know, back to the sort of salami, it's not, hopefully it's not quite as bad as CDO, CD squared, whatever. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I just go back to, to having the same question. I, I uh, so far as I'm aware, the members of our organization they're they're looking at this from a different angle, which is that that the companies they're investing in, that they're lending to, are taking out these arrangements now. When they're repackaged and securitized and reissued and sold on, that's that. Perhaps there's someone else on the panel who can tell us what makes that an attractive in, investment. But but from the ELFA's perspective, we'd like. To, to have better disclosure when those those transactions are entered into. But, I mean, maybe I can come in, in here. Um, I mean, these these uh, funds were sold to Credit Suisse investors and, and to to GAM investors before um, as um, low risk. Uh, as you, met, you mentioned earlier, Jane, the uh, the insurance w- was supposed to under underwrite these, so that uh, you know. There shouldn't have been any any risk of of defaulting that the insurance policies lapsed, and which is why the funds ultimately uh, suspended. Um, but but also they were they were kind of seen as an alternative to a current account to to just invest in cash. You know, slightly better than um, almost zero um, interest. You know, a lot of these investors, some of some of whom are in Switzerland. You know, you've, you've got um, negative oh, rates across liquid. Europe. So you know, it, it's and, and they were supposed to be liquid as well. So it's kind of a holding pen. You you know, part your spare cash in these funds for a couple of couple of months, or whatever, and earn. You know, okay levels of interest, and that's what a lot of these people uh, were going in there thinking. Uh, they weren't thinking, you know, I'm going to make ten percent a year. They were thinking, you know, this is a place to park my cash for a little while. We 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 just discovered a um, complete side side note. We've we've discovered a a Chinese property company um, which uh, is listed in in the US. And at the end of last year, they uh, running into difficulties. They uh, went to their shareholders to raise 170 million dollars, uh, and then they put 150 million of that into these funds. And now it's all it's all uh, locked in. So I think they just thought, well, we've got all this cash. You know, let's let's pop it in one of these funds, and we can get it out in a little bit. Uh, and now it's stuck. Um, so yeah, I think that was probably the attraction for some of these people. Yeah. So, um, Kazim, um, I think we do need to get into some of the accounting and um, just as a little prelude, I mean, I've, I've looked at Note 20 and Carillion's, you know, 2016 annual report the last last full year. Um, and and you, you, well, you can see that trade creditors went up a lot there and you can see that other financial liabilities went up quite a lot. Um, but the, the explanation in Note 20 was pretty sparse. Um, so... Tell, tell me your, some of your concerns about this. Great. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think uh, Owen provided a much longer history. Um, so what I will provide a little bit of background to it is from 2016, I got involved in, have been involved since then. Um, but before that, I think I just want to make it one way clear cut statement. Um, supply chain finance itself is not the main problem. There could be some bits of it that could be problem, but itself is not a problem. The problem is mainly a lack of transparency around it. And I think there's also an economic and accounting mismatch. And that's why I think investors or anyone looking at it, they don't get what's, what's exactly happening. And also remember that there's an information lag as well, because even if you start reverse factoring, it usually will be captured 90, 100 days later. So, and it's a very short term liquidity, as someone was saying that you could have a liquidity squeeze and you're in trouble within that 100 days. 
So, so these are the couple of points that we need to keep in mind. And that's why I think it becomes so important that uh, it should be timely uh, brought in, uh, in in reports. Now, starting from 2016, I got involved with uh, when Ebengo in Spain went down. And uh, if you remember, um, it had 7.9 billion reported liabilities and its hidden liabilities and the reverse factoring were uh, 12 billion. That's a big sum. Um, and, and I think it, it was blamed on confirming, which I'll get back a bit later. Um, and I think once I, so I did some background searching, like, all right, who's doing it? Where, how far it's stretched? And speaking to regulators and analysts, we found out that it's mainly started um, before that, I think Spanish bank and Spanish speaking world it was starting. Because if you remember Latin America, Brazil was in recession as well around that time. And a lot of companies there, they use that um, to run through that liquidity squeeze that they were having. And a lot of Spanish banks were involved in there. And actually, when Ebengoa was in trouble, uh, uh, Esma did pick it up. And in their 2015 enforcement report, they highlighted- That's the, that's the that's European right. Securities Regulator, yeah. That's correct, that's correct, yeah. Esma. So they did pick it up. They had a very nice commentary about it. And they, they had a, it was an impact that uh, Ebengoa later on provided a one-page accounting policy disclosures and improved. Before that, there was nothing in there. And then there was a lot of disclosure coming in. But it was a bit little too late. Um, Moving forward, 2017, 2018, um, I think generally there was a lot of confusion. I, I don't think, I think there was an information breakdown as well. First of all, who is responsible for this? Is it the standard setter ISV responsible for it? Is it the regulator responsible for it? Um, or is it the auditor responsible for it? And it's kind of, a, it was a ping pong going around and no one was picking it up until Carillion um, and And I think um, on analyst side, I think they weren't, getting the accounting because they thought like accounting is not reflective of economics. And accountants were saying that, oh no, the accounting was just fine. If you look at the rules, it's perfectly fine. And I think that that, that was a big uh, breakdown of communication. But if you look at Karelian, it was it's very interesting. Like I think you also highlighted. Um, Karelian was involved in, in uh, reverse factoring uh, transactions. And in my entire career, I looked at a lot of accounts. But if you look at 2017 accounts, I've never seen a same amount of operating cash flow number of 73.3 million reported in both years. Now that's very, very unlike. I haven't seen it. I've seen first time, maybe I, I might see it sometime. But how is this possible? This is only possible if you have some kind of uh, accounting gimmickry that you can pull in because economics wise, it's very, very rare that you are you can produce that same number. That was one of the red flags. But even if, within that, if you look at the uh, changes in working capital, there was a 300 million uh, coming in, uh, which basically boosted it to 72.2 million. Uh, analysts did pick it up, and I think it, it, hedge funds were after it and it was in trouble. Uh, but within that, I think if you look at on the other side as well, uh, Santander and HSBC were, were, were also one of the lenders. Santander's in 2018 booked loss of 60 million. Uh, HSBC just got out a little bit. I think they cut the exposure via derivative and they transferred it to Dutch pension fund. And I think there was one more Asian investor that got hooked up to it. Um, moving forward, uh, 2019, I think I was trying very hard to uh, bring it to the attention of regulators and standard sector, like, look, something needs to be done with it. And I, I think I still continue to have that communication back uh, breakdown because I, I think it wasn't people, because there's like variants of supply chain. And I think a lot of time people will use the terminology, but they didn't mean what it was actually. Um, so I wrote a blog uh, in 2019, July. Um, so I explained, and I said, like, economically, uh, you basically have three kinds of supply chain financing. If, forget about the counting and actual transaction. Um, now, actually, with Owen telling me that future receivers coming in, I think that's a fourth, because I wasn't aware of that, because that's something new uh, coming in. But if you look at, like, I, I'll give a very simple example. Like, I am a buyer. Um, I am very cash rich. I have a very high credit rating. I have a supplier um, who is not as uh, high profile um, and we have a 90 day industry practice terms condition. So 90 day I pay him and he's fine. Now he is having liquidity issues and if he goes directly um, to his bank or third party, they'll charge him a lot of money because his rating isn't that high. So as a good corporate citizen, I'll say, oh, fine, I'll help you out. Uh, you're a good supplier. So you can, I'll arrange my banks to take those invoices they discount it. So instead of 90 day, you can get it at uh, 10th day. And on 90 day, I will, um, bank will get it. And that's how it works. So this is fine. So it is providing, uh, this is a good, and that's what I call it, a good uh, reverse factoring. 
Now, after some time, I say like, hold on a second, I can actually squeeze this uh, buyer a bit more. So instead of uh, me giving him a free pass, why not I negotiate with him instead of 90 days, let's say uh, 120 days? Because if you extend that, that increases my, so basically I'm asking him to fund my working capital and he can use my uh, discount rate, which is lower, uh, to discount it back. So it's kind of a win-win situation, as our former prime minister said, it's a win-win situation for everyone. Um, now, the problem with this is coming is like, once you move away from industry practice, um, it becomes a problem because, uh, let's say for example, if you're going to 120 days, now if, um, so so the, this one, I call it a bad reverse factor. The reason being that you have moved away from the normal 90 day term. Because let's say if that supply, supplier still goes bust, now you have to get a new supplier who's on your equal standing. He said, I'm not gonna accept 20 days. Actually, I'm gonna want 90 days because my rating is very good. I'm in a more uh, strong reporting position. Now what's gonna happen is a retrenchment gonna happen because now you'll have an outflow. Uh, from my perspective, I have to now reduce it back and I, an outflow gonna happen. Now I have two choices. Either I get a financing for it, or I do a third arrangement, which I call confirm. So I go to the, my bank, I say like, instead of discounting it for my supplier, you know what, you just pay it on my behalf and I will pay you after 180 days. So now I'm paying the interest, which is called confirming. And confirming and bad reverse factoring are economically the same, just interest is paid by different parties. And, and I think uh, rating agencies are making a right adjustment for, for that, which, which I understand. And I think, Understand this now, what happens from a reporting perspective, we have been saying, like I've been saying, that for um, bad reverse factoring, we cannot do anything. Just contractually now supplier and the buyer have legally agreed a longer period. Although there's a, a market abuse on it, that's a different topic, but they have uh, contractually agreed to it. Um, but on the other side, uh, for confirming, where I am getting a bank or third party to extend it for another 30 days, that movement should go in finance. And so if you look in Carillion, uh, what that would have been is like, if let's say assume that 300 million was related to reverse factoring, that should not have been included in operating. It should have been excluded in financing. That means they would have reported an operating uh, outflow, so loss. So even for a very retail investor, it's very obvious that they're operating wise and not uh, doing it correctly. Now, um, just quickly moving forward, I think FRC Lab, uh, they were very proactive. They supported that. Uh, in, and I think the first time in the history, in October 2019, FASB was written a letter about Big Four. Uh, when this was really uh, gearing up, that look, this something needs to be done about it. And they wrote a letter to them. Um, and I think other high profile cases also came in at M NMC Heath. 2020 Q1, uh, Moody's wrote a letter uh, to ISP Interpretation Committee saying that this needs to be explained. And when COVID-19 came in, I said, like, this is a perfect storm for this because usually investors say, like, oh, cash flow is going to dry up, let's say 30%, 40%, their worst stress scenario. But COVID-19 literally blocked your entire cash flow. So that was a perfect storm for this kind of financing because this would be the first hit and it could easily aggravate the situation. And sorry, just a, a wrap up quickly. And I, I think coming back, I think it's, it's reporting wise, it's very important that it should be. And coming back to ISB uh, decision, Again, I think um, like it's you, you need to reflect. I think what ISB went ahead was they wanted they went ahead with legal form over economic substance, and I think they're not um, thinking for the time being to clearly define what is the where is the dividing line between operating and financing. I think that is the key issue. You think the, the cash flow, flow, you're you're most bothered about the cash flow statement, aren't you? So you're saying it's yeah, yeah. it is actually transparent in the balance sheet, albeit you know you have to read note tw note twenty or whatever. But, the, but in the cash flow statement, the idea that um, but delaying payments is a, you know, you can use your sort of wiggle room in terms of working capital, um, de delaying payments to make to, to make your operating just position look better Absolutely. is just a, a, a source of abuse. Sorry, just a very quick one, because I know I've been criticizing ISB uh, decision on this. But if you look at the other side as well, like uh, ISB has produced, ISB and FASB has produced some great standards. Like for example, revenue recognition standard, when it was introduced, uh, it provided great clarity. And one very good example is Rolls-Royce. Now Rolls-Royce previously was recognizing engine losses as intangible assets. And a lot of analysts, they reported that, they gave, they plucked the numbers and they gave it a credit in CapEx, uh, which is exactly like a reverse factoring because instead of recognizing a loss in your operating cash flow, 
they were giving a credit in CapEx, which means like you will have future benefit coming from it. And once the standard came in, it highlighted the issues and there was an instance where it was downgraded in, within two months. Now, had that standard not come at that time, it would have come with COVID-19, it wouldn't have been a notch uh, downgrade, it would have been a full uh, grade downgrade. Just it shows you like a good standard, yeah. why such clarity. So um, are we, I mean, um, perhaps Alex would like to come in on this. If, 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 I, if, if yeah. I could say, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, do you want to ask a question? Well, well do, do keep on this, but, 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 this, but if, as part of your answer, please tell me whether or not you think the, the IASB has done enough, which I understand to be, well, the standards are okay, but they're not disclosing enough in the spirit of the law. Well, the, the, the fact is they uh, not enough is being disclosed by most companies. We see some reasonable disclosure from some companies. Um, so I was, do, I was doing a straw poll, only half a dozen not scientific um, of six companies that I thought were very likely to have some sort of arrangement like this. Two of them mentioned it in a note that was about you know, that long. It was a reasonable description. Uh, the other four, nothing at all. Uh, and that sort of mirrors a, uh, an experience I had when I first came into contact with this. I thought, this is interesting. I'll go to a, um, go to a conference. And I you know, met a lot of people, exchanged cards with people from big organizations who were head of supply chain finance for this and that. And I thought, OK, I've got my business card. I'm back at the office. I'm going to go and I'm just going to look at their accounts and see what they say. Nothing. I mean, literally, there was there was no disclosure. So it's not a question of even is the accounting right. Just just give me a note saying I've got this in place. Um, this is this is just a rough idea of what it is, and this is how I account for it. I, I don't mind unraveling the accounting if you tell me what's going on. But I think that the, the real problem isn't so much the accounting, it's the fact you just wouldn't know anything was happening from the accounting. Yeah, just, a bit, just on the um, sort of some of the critical um, uh, leverage ratios, would you, when you um, do have enough information and you think some of this looks like short, just should like short term borrowing or not so short term borrowing, if it's 180 days, um, but are you adding that into the debt where you're doing a sort of net debt to EBITDA you are so you're, you're yeah, absolutely. That. so you're able to do that you know experts and all the rest of it but lots of uh, you know not so expert people would would not think to do that yeah it's really tricky I mean it's you know um you, you've got two very experienced accountants on this panel I think we could we could kind of work it out because we'd look at trade creditors and you know it's the um, the Krillian example the only clue was those other creditors going up there was a, I think there was a, there was a note in an operating review somewhere saying we've got this arrangement, but absolutely no numbers. So unless you knew to look at the other creditors' yeah. line and able to get an answer of what it was, you've, yeah. you've got nothing. And, and the problem um, partly yeah. is you don't, you don't often see. Yeah, you know, that was absolutely gross. They had about two hundred million of net debt and about five hundred million of supply chain financing. So if any, well, we didn't, we didn't rate it. It was just that little bit too small to. To get a credit rating, but um, it should have stuck out like a sore thumb. The average company, it's a lot more subtle, and obviously, working capital does move for various other reasons as well. So it's not as easy as just saying, "Look, trade creditors have gone up." Why? Because there could be loads of other explanations. And just uh, one last thing on the accounting. It sounds to me as though there's also quite a lot of wiggle room over the accounting. That you know, because of if you can sort of use force majeure and extend the terms with your um, financer, then at those sort of crucial balance sheet dates, you can make you know it, that stuff's not registering as owed as as, as owed. Uh, and yeah, I mean the, 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 the rules are pretty vague, and there are plenty of people out there who will advise you how to how to not break the rules but do something which is yeah. So so, so, the, so we're also you know we're talking about the big opportunities for what you know window dressing as it's technically called. Yeah. So Sabrina, um, what what do you feel about um, the account? What would you like to see? Well, I think that investors shouldn't have to follow breadcrumbs to price risk. They shouldn't have to <laughs> dig through the financial statement notes and, you know, find clues. I mean, it's not a, it's, it's, you know, it's not like a fun treasure hunt. It's a protection of their, you know, and investors capital and they are trained and their jobs are to price risk. And to do that, they need to be able to, 
to compare apples with apples and, and not, you know, like I said, go, go on some sort of a hunt for potentially having a red flag here, a red flag there. And, and all of a sudden it, it's too late. So we would like to see better disclosure. We, we're engaging with the ISB on that basis. We, you know, we've had discussions with them to explain what the issues are and why we think this is something that deserves, you know, a reconsideration. And it is very much our hope that, you know, they'll take that into account and, and have another look. Yeah. But but do you agree with Catherine that they also perhaps uh, they're looking at the cash flow statement that actually there's, they need to change some of the rules here as well in terms oh, of absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. not just disclosure. It's actually some of the definitions need sorting out. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just a, just a quick one, uh, because I think if you look at how these supply chain finances are uh, legally structured, they know very well the accounting rules. So they don't go beyond 365 days because they know if they go beyond 365 days, it will become long term. So it will have to be. Uh, classified under separately. So it remains within 365 days. Then they also know the derecognition rules because I think in some of them they had novation because if you novate it legally, it's now different. So like you're forced to treat it more transparently. And some of them had those arrangements that they, they didn't have that novation. So it's like, oh, we don't have to derecognize it. So let's include it. But just to clarify, I think disclosure is no doubt, disclosure is the most important because even if analysts can trace it with accounting, you have a lagging information, 90 days. And remember, it's a very short-term supply because if you have a um, credit squeeze uh, coming in or a big crisis coming in, this will be the first hit because banks could withdraw or other uh, shadow banking could withdraw. And the first hit you will have on your working capital, and that could be a catalyst. There's no point uh, without any second thoughts. Disclosure is the most important. What's the facility on those creditors? How long can you extend it? What is the interest rate on it? And what are other terms? And also how much outstanding facility is remaining? As at that date. So that's a proactive, clear cut yeah. disclosure that I think analysts would like to see. So it looks like debt and sniffs like debt. So report on it like that. Yeah. So, Owen, um, would you like to return us to 30,000 feet a bit on this in terms of, uh, you know, is it? Is this, is this just abuse that's sort of been facilitated by some of these opportunities um, for obscuring what's happening and um, fuzzy rules? Or is it an abuse that will always have when i mean who i suppose you could say who was the desperate party in this you know was it was it the big the original big co you know say it's a steel company who's suddenly facing what you know big rise in raw material costs and it hasn't been able to pass it on yet i mean what, what what's um what are the fundamental problems here well i mean i, I to, to to go back to sabrina's point i think if if, if uh if, if there is a lack of transparency and you've got all these kind of uh, this this treasure hunt, it's it's quite fun for for some of my colleagues who are really specialised in this position. It's it's great fun for them to go digging those stories. But you know, as journalists, we would love obviously much more transparency in this area. I mean, in terms of if we're talking specifically about this this green seal case, and you know, I take the the, the comments of of uh, the panelists earlier that you know this this is an aberration. I think this this is really kind of. Hopefully it won't, but it, it, it may stain supply chain finance um, because uh, you know ninety nine percent of supply chain finance, supply chain finance is is um, very worthy and it does an incredible job for a lot of the suppliers and that sort of stuff. In terms of the the, the Credit Suisse, uh, the the um, the green seal issue, I think there are still lots of question marks um, around some of these uh, receivables, some of these invoices. Uh, and there are lots of question marks around the relationship between Greensill and uh, GFG Alliance, the Sanjeev Gupta businesses. Um, and I think that's going to be played out. And I think um, um, that is really where a lot of these problems come from. It's it's a lot of that the relationship between those two entities, the overexposure to to that to, to the GFG Alliance. That was what was picked up uh, by um, BaFin, the German regulator, in, in, in regards to Green Seals Bank there. So I think this is just, it's a case where um, it, it's an it's a incredible financial story and there's so many parts to it, but it, I think it is quite separate to a lot of the issues that you've been talking about uh, today in terms of some of the, 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 uh, the, the other problems with supply chain financing and, and, and accounting standards. Mm. You could, but Greensill, I mean, banks, where they've got um, a big exposure to one client, or in this case, you know, a group of entities that happen to be ultimately one client, um, is, aren't prudential regulators supposed to spot that? Aren't the filings from these um, financial institutions supposed to show up? 
um, these sorts of ex- exposures. Um, it certainly well, really feels as though the, the problems of the great of the global financial crisis have have not been solved. Yet. Well, I, and I think again, with uh, as you said, you know, the GFG Alliance isn't one company; it is a collection of of scores of companies uh, loosely around Sanjeev Gupta, his family, his friends. That there, it's. It, it, that they don't they don't have consolidated accounts. It, it's very it's you'd have to do an awful lot of work to kind of get to the bottom. You know, I know I, colleagues have been doing our so old friend aggregation. Ab, ab, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So so that's certainly an element at play here, um, and I think that is probably one of the reasons it took regulators so long to realise the exposure here. Uh, as I mentioned, Barfin in Germany were aware of this, and I think uh, going back. Um, Last, certainly last year, maybe even as early as March, they were asking questions about uh, the exposure to GFG. Um, UK regulators a little bit behind the curve, uh, but still, I think you know there, there were some question marks around some of the UK entities uh, as well. Um, but again, it's it, I think it just underlines the the peculiar nature of this situation. Uh, I'm doubting there'll probably be you know, similar incidences that, that arise in future. But that's what everyone's kind yeah, of asking. Well, thinking about you know there's a lot of heavily indebted companies around so there are you know this is this is a vehicle for desperate companies to get a bit more money in a bit sooner without people realizing the way their debt's accumulating and I suppose you know that's a, a future concern but in any of the other others anybody else like to comment on this sort of you know where you know should the prudential should the regulators have been quicker to spot some of these growing exposures and some of these more you know tipping points in terms of um, something relatively straightforward becoming too exotic and too risky. If I may just add a quick point, um, I think uh, also just want to reiterate the first uh, key point I mentioned, uh, lack of transparency. Because even if we look at uh, Greensill, um, they had an uh, insurer uh, that was providing credit um, and that probably would squeeze their margins. And basically if they that also creates a complacency because like you have insurers backing you, you could expand it, uh, you make more profits, more insurers, insurer confidence would go in. But when things reverse, they reverse in the same way uh, because of lack of transparency, because no one knows exactly the underlying how, how much exposure it is, what risk is there. And as all everyone's sitting during on that chain, they'll say like, oh, hold on, COVID-19 came in, corporates are already too much indebted. Someone can go back and they start pulling out. And actually, maybe the business might be stable, but it's just a crisis uh, of trust that comes in from, from risk of lack of transparency. Some pulls in and then basically because of that crisis of trust, you could uh, go down. Mm. And of course, um, the, the insurers pulling out was a, was a key trigger here. Um, Alex, would you, is there anything you'd like to add on this? Uh... I, I suppose, I mean, I, I, it's very easy to point at regulators and say you know, they should have done better, but um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. What I'm gonna do is sympathize. Uh, you know, we've had a, a boom in the last 15, 20 years in, in, in fintech. Um, and it, it sort of comes back to the point about the um, uh, the receivables that haven't been issued yet, or the invoices that haven't been issued yet, and trying try to do it based on forecast purchases. You know, you can see completely how, if you had an algorithm and you could see patterns of purchases, uh, and you were currently paying somebody after 15 days when they, they've got the invoice, they got it confirmed by a supplier, where maybe actually they want to get it on day day two or day three, or even day minus five. Um, and you could say, okay, this company has been selling, you know, 100 tons of coal to this other company every week for the last five years. Yeah, fine. You know, they're going to keep doing that. We can work on that basis. Um, so there's a sort of common sense element to that. But you just don't know how good the algorithms are at, at predicting that how far they take it you know if it's yeah they did sell roughly that much but actually some some months it was nothing some months it was double um you don't know what happens when you aggregate that up on a massive business it's, it, it, i'm supposed i'm just saying there is a huge amount of complexity and i have every sympathy for for any third party trying to understand that uh, i mean what, yeah, i'm very lucky in that what we look at tends to be comparatively simple um it's just some straightforward companies but the complexity is, is is certainly a major issue that, that needs to be understood here so you say you're looking at just to clarify stuff that's comparatively simple does that mean that you're rejecting stuff uh, that looks too complicated no so 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 i'm i'm, I'm talking 
literally me here. I look at I look at corporates. So um, just look at companies. Ah, that's good. Okay, so we're coming towards the end. So I'd like to just ask each of you um, uh, briefly to say, and I, I think it's perhaps the theme is, you know, it, there is a danger of throwing a baby the baby out with the bathwater here. We've got something that's historically um, established. Um, benefits companies including small companies which um who pay a lot more for credit than big apparently safe companies so what you know good but how can we get to a point where the, the tipping point between it being a good thing and it being abused is much easier to spot and um, that's I have to be fairly brief but start, um kazim we'll, we'll go back in reverse order. Oh, okay. Um, I think I'll, I'll say the same thing. I think transparency, yeah, because if you don't have transparency on any of these kind of issues, you usually create a blind spot for market participants because if you have clear transparency, people can see it, understand it, they can price it correctly. I think it, it also restores confidence. And with lack of transparency, I think you're running that risk that an accident could happen. So again, I would say that uh, really it's transparency and I think regulators should um, take, uh, I'm not going to blame them, but I say like uh, regulators should push for, I think FRC Lab did publish a report uh, I think uh, last year, um, which last year, a couple of years back, uh, sources of uh, cash, which was quite good because it highlighted some good practices and was encouraging. Uh, but I think from my perspective, um, I think accounting and disclosure is, is the main bit that needs to be uh, addressed. So, Sabrina, is that enough for you, or do you do you actually think that these the standards should uh, be tougher on some of this stuff? Well, I think that the, he's hit the nail on the head. Transparency, disclosure, you know, st stronger standards in that regard is exactly what we need here. You know, you it needs to be clear. And I think one of the red flags for standard centers should be where companies might be using rules specifically so that they can appear more financially uh, credit worthy. That's when you have to take a second look at the rules and figure out, you know, how are they being reverse engineered to, to be taken advantage of in that way? And, and and how is that affecting investors' ability to then price the risks that, that they're taking on? Yeah, absolutely. And the, 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 the worse, worse the behavior of the company, the more likely it is to manipulate. Um, Alex? I think, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be three for that. So, so disclosure, transparency. I think there's a degree to which the investors have to help themselves. So, you know, if they get a, if they get a small amount of disclosure, they need to ask the questions. If, if, a, if a CFO is getting that question every time he meets an investor, what does Note 26 mean? They'll probably be inclined to write more. So, so there is an element to which um, this is never going to be utterly straightforward because the arrangements are sometimes out of necessity quite complex. So it'll be a question of explaining it. Uh, but if, if it becomes something which is still so obscure that nobody really asks about it, then companies aren't going to talk about it very much. Mm. And just finally with you, Owen, it sounds to me as though there's going to be enough wiggle room here to keep you and other um, uh, you know, hacks and diggers um, busy and uh, exclusive uh, hunting for, for years, actually. Well, absolutely. I, I think I'm, I'm not going to um, argue against more transparency, but um, when there is when there are clouds, it means there's, there's stuff for us to get uh, stuck into. I think, I, you know, Maybe our big learning from all of this is that, um, you know, when an ex-prime minister is touting innovative financial engineering products backed by um, artificial intelligence, we should we should run a mile. <laughs> I think, and on that bombshell, <laughs> so thank, I'd like to thank you all very very much for for, for taking part and making this arcane area, you know, pretty understandable and ex explaining where where we tip from a good thing into excess. So th thanks again to all of you and um, thank you to everybody for, for watching or listening. <laughs>